Good evening, folks. We're glad you're here to uh, join us in learning about the Word of God tonight with Stony Run Church. You know, there's a lot of hustle and bustle today. People talk about stimulus money, and they're excited about that. But you know what? That money will only carry you as far as that last dollar. But we're here to talk about the Word of God. We're here to learn about God, and we're going to learn about the things that are going to take us throughout this life through eternity, which is going to carry you so much more. So we're glad you're here. We're going to go ahead and start the service in prayer, and we're going to trust God and know that he's going to see us through this situation. I am so glad that he's in control and he holds my future, and he is my firm foundation in this dismal world that we live in. Father God, Lord, we thank you for being able to be in your house tonight, oh God. Father, we thank you for being able to be here to feel your presence, oh God, to feel your sustaining force, dear God, to know that we are in a world that seems to be spinning and blowing out of control, but you are our firm foundation, oh God. Father God, we thank you and we praise you. Now, Lord, we pray your blessings upon this service, oh God. The praise and worship music that is done, that it would be uplifting, that it would draw people, that it would kindle people's spirits, draw them closer unto you. Father, we pray for our pastor as he brings forth the word of life tonight, oh God, that it would be applied to people's hearts and lives, that it would change them forever. Father, we desire your presence, oh God. We desire you in every aspect of our life. Lord, we just pray that your blessings will be upon us, that you would bless everything that we do tonight, and we'll give you the praise for it all. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you should take my place, that you would bear my cross. You I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings the chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nation with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I might be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. 
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. I want to do that verse again. You know, we've heard this song a long time in our lives. But we shouldn't take it for granted because that is still amazing grace that he took us where we were in sin. And he still died for us. He still came on a cross and walked to the, hill, to the hills of Golgotha for us, for each one of us. It's so amazing that he would do that for us. This time when you sing it, think about that. Think about what God has done for you, what he's brought you from. I was telling my son this week, when everything else in the world seems like it's going crazy, stand, stand, stand on his amazing grace. Hallelujah, Jesus. We praise your name. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. Twas grace, thank you, Jesus, that taught my heart to feel and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone Unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He my shield and portion be as long as life endures. He will my shield, he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, my chance.
Hallelujah. We praise your name, Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer thank tonight. You. Father God, we just come in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I just thank you, God. I thank, thank you, you for Lord. this opportunity to come together. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that we, we are the church. Name. God, I thank you for Stony Run. I thank you as the, as the church listens to this. Lord, that we join together and we realize that it's your Holy Spirit that knits us together. It's your Holy Spirit. It's the mortar between the bricks, the living bricks of the church, God. And so, Lord, I pray right now, God, I pray for, for my people tonight, God. I pray, Lord, that whatever they may be facing right now, yes. that they understand and realize that you name. are in the midst of it with them, God. Hallelujah. Lord, you've never you, promised Lord. to take us around anything, God. But, Lord, what you do say is you say, Lo, I am with you always, Amen. even until the end of the age, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. That's right. So for that one right now that needs a healing touch, God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch their body right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord. Lord, whatever they're facing, God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch, that you would yes. heal, that you would move, God. Lord, touch our bodies, God. Touch our finances, Lord. I know that there's people that are that right now, they're, they're, they're uneasy and unsure about their financial situation in this world. And Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that they will not worry because you have them. Lord, you have the cattle of a thousand hill. Lord, you have provision in places that we don't even know about, God. Uh, and you, so, Lord, I pray right now that you would open the, the storehouses of heaven, Lord, and just shower it into their lives right now, God. Lord, I pray that as those that are, are lonely right now, that they're combating loneliness yes. and depression because yes, they're not able Jesus to be name. in contact one with another because, God, we know how powerful the human touch is, God. We know how powerful the human touch is, Lord, that yes. we need we need to have contact with people we need to we need to feel one another's presence God Lord I pray that you would take that place God I pray that you would step into that gap right now for that one that, that is so lonely yes, right now God that you would just just fill them with your presence and your power God as only you can yes, that they would feel Jesus your presence God and know that you are there with them you've not left them you've not forsaken them you are there and God, I thank you for that right now. God, I thank you that you're touching minds. God, for that one that's struggling with depression right now. God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch their mind in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, that the darkness would be dispelled. Lord, that the light of Christ would shine into their mind right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, that they would feel and realize and know that you are there, that you've not left, you've not forsaken them, but you are there, God. Lord, I just pray for the church, God. Lord, I pray for whatever, whatever you're facing today as my church, God. I pray, Lord, that you touch each and every need out there, everything, God. Lord, be real. Be present with the people, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would, you would, you would touch the word tonight, God, as I, as I teach and, and preach, God, that you would inhabit what I'm saying, God. Lord, I pray that the anointing of God be upon it because, Lord, I know that without anointing, it's just noise. And so, God, I pray, Lord, that it not be noise tonight, God, but it be anointed teaching. Lord, I pray your anointing, your power, God, just move mightily and powerfully in this place, God. And, Lord, we just thank you, God. We thank you for who you are because, God, you are with us, God. You're not, you are with us, Lord. We are not alone. You're going through this with us, God. And so, Lord, I thank you for that, God. And I pray, God, that you just move mightily and swiftly, Lord, as only you can. And God, we're just going to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. God bless you, Stony Run. Uh, I miss you all. Brother Tom, good to see you tonight. Amen. I'm just I'm thankful for each and every one of you that are watching tonight. I know there's some of you probably watching the live feed right now. I, I bless you. I bless you in the name of Jesus tonight. I just want to reach Amen. out to you. I wish I could reach yes. out and touch you right now and just let you know we yes. are walking through this. I feel the Holy Ghost right now so Amen. strong. I mean, I feel the anointing of God right now. I love it. I love it because that's what I, I yearn and desire is, is to feel the presence and power of God in my life. And, yes. and so I pray that you're feeling the same presence, the same power that I'm feeling right now. And I, I want you to just, oh man, I, I just... I want you to Thank hang you in Jesus. there. Amen? Amen. Hang in there. Amen. Hang in there. Look, this too we shall pass. We, 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 you know, we're teaching on the plagues. We've been, we've been through uh, some of the plagues already in Exodus. We're going to pick up in chapter 9. 
these plagues, the people were going through plagues. They didn't know when it was going to end. They didn't know how many God was going to send. God didn't start out and say, look, there's going to be nine plagues, and then there's going to be the death of the firstborn, the the Passover, and then it's going to be over. He never never told them that. He never told Moses how many times he was going to have to go. And so, so I encourage you that as we go through this pandemic, we go through this difficult time, what you need to see in the midst of this Anytime something like this is going on, you need to see the power of That's God. Right. That's right. You need to see God in the midst Look of this. He's want, he wants his people to see him yes. high and lifted up. I mean, he wants, to see, he wants us to know yes. and realize he's speaking to us right now through the midst of this. What's he trying to tell us? I mean, he's trying to get our attention. And, yes. and, and we've got to focus on him. And if we'll keep our eyes on Christ, then he'll take us through. So I just, I just thank him for that tonight. Yeah. I thank, thank him for you, that Lord. tonight. Hallelujah. So we're, we're, we're going to start in, in um, Exodus chapter 9 tonight. And, and I do want to remind you that these plagues that we're, we're studying, they're coming in, in sets of three. you got three plagues and another three and another three. And, and, and as it goes, I mean, as we go through these, we've gone through some already. The first plague, the river was turned to blood. That was announced to Pharaoh at the river in the morning, Moses went out and announced that. And then you had the plague of the frogs. You had plagues of the lice. Then the fourth plague, you had flies. And that was announced to Pharaoh again at the river in the morning. So, so God is kind of like sending this in sets of threes. So we're going to pick up with the fifth plague tonight in chapter 9 in Exodus. So I want you, if you've got your Bible at home, I want you to open up your word. Open up the word of God. I don't know if you noticed this old Bible that I've got here, but it's beat all to pieces. But, but that's because it's been well-read and well-worn. Um, it's been through a whole lot of stuff with me. I've had to, had to glue it all back together. There's highlighted stuff. There's stuff written all in it. There's sticky notes stuck in there. There's all kinds of little notes that I've put in there. I, I pray that as you, as you watch this at home, that you, I, I pray your Bible looks well-worn. I pray that you, you open it up, that you're, you're able to, to touch it and, and, and look at it. That, that there may be places in there where you can see the, 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 the dried marks of the tears that you shed at times when you were trying to get through something. And then remember that God took you through, that God took you through in the midst of it. So we're going to start in Exodus chapter 9, starting in verse 1. I do want to read just a little bit here. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, so God's speaking directly to Moses, man. He is, he's got Moses' ear. Moses is no longer the one that says that I don't speak well. I need somebody to speak for him. You know what's funny about this is that Moses said, I can't speak. I'm, I'm, I have stammering lips or whatever. I can't, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not well-spoken, well-versed. But do you notice that he said, okay, I'll give you Aaron to speak for him. But how many times did Aaron actually speak for Moses through all this? None. That's right, sister, none. He didn't ever speak for him one time. See, Moses was just making excuses. God knew who he had. He says, that's fine. I'll give you, I'll give you Aaron. He can go with you, but, but you're going to be fine, and you'll, you'll speak through this. So, so the Lord says to Moses, he says, go into Pharaoh and tell him this. Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. I mean, I want you to understand that, that throughout all of these plagues, through all of these things that have been, have been going on, God's main concern is to let His people go that they might serve Him. Let my people go that they may serve me. I want to tell you, and, and, I, and I pray that you understand that as the people of God, as the children of God, that God, we have a special place in God's heart. He wants us to serve Him. He wants us to be able to worship Him. He wants us to do all those things. And there's going to be times where, where God is going to, going to free us up. He's going to free us up that we might serve Him. And I think right now might be one of those times in the history of this nation where God said, you know what, I let my people go that they might serve me. I'm going to remove all the distraction. I'm going to remove everything to where folks can start serving me. And I I think that that might be what's going on. So verse verse 2 says this. He says, for if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, Behold, the hand of the Lord will be upon your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep. A very severe pestilence. I I think that God is, is reminding Pharaoh of this. You are responsible for your actions, Pharaoh. 
Okay, if you want to hang on to these people, you want to you want to hold on to them that you refuse to let them go. Then understand this. If you continue in this way, then the hand of the Lord is going to be upon you, upon your cattle, upon the horses, upon the donkeys, upon the camel, upon the oxen, upon your people. The, the hand of God is going to come upon you. And, and, and that's a that's a lesson to us that when we are walking in disobedience to God. The hand of God will come upon us. See, I, I want you to think about the mercy of God in the midst of all of this. All God wants is He wants two things out of these plagues. The first thing that God wants out of the plague is the children of Israel to be set free that they might be able to serve Him. They've got to leave Egypt. They've got to get out of Egypt to, in order to go to the promised land that He has given them, the land of, of milk and honey, that beautiful land that He has set aside for them. They've got to be set free to leave Egypt and go there so they've got to be able to go but the second thing that God wants to do through this is to let all the world to let the Egyptians to let the Hebrews to let the whole known world at that time understand that he is God Almighty he is Yahweh in the midst of all this understand there is a God his name is Yahweh he is the Lord the great I am he is the one and he wants everyone to see that in the midst of that so when things like this were going on when these plagues were taking place it was to show the power of God to the people that they could see that so he says Pharaoh look you are you are responsible for your actions and if you refuse then the hand of the Lord is going to be upon your cattle your horses your donkeys your camels the oxen the sheep a very severe pestilence verse 4 says and the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so that nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel so I want you to understand what what a miracle is, is, is fixing to happen here all the livestock of Egypt they're going to have the pestilence upon them but the the livestock in joke uh, Goshen the ones of the children of Israel they're not going to be touched nothing's going to happen to them he's going to make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt that should give you some hope in this world today that God can separate the people of God the children of God he can make a difference he can he can separate us and there's going to come a time where there will be a separation there's going to come a time when the church will be raptured will be taken out of this world and will be separated from from the world that the Lord might keep us safe in a place right there a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt so nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel not only does he does he he pronounce this but then he gives a time when's it gonna happen because see that's the beautiful thing about about a, a miracle is is not only is is God gonna do something but he sets an appointed time for it to happen look I'm gonna tell you exactly when it's gonna happen it says in verse 5 then the Lord appointed a set time saying tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So I just want to make sure you understand. Tomorrow it's coming. Which means that, that Pharaoh actually had, had that night to think about what God had told him. He, could have, he probably stewed on it all night. He probably wondered, pestilence on the cattle. Let me see, what does that mean? What's that going to mean? I mean, I don't know what pestilence. I, he sent blood. He sent frogs. He sent all kinds of things. Um, what, what is pestilence on the cattle? And he probably had that time. God's given him that time. Once again, God has given him time to change his mind God's given him time he's saying look I'm gonna do this tomorrow if Pharaoh would have stopped and said ho 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 Lord you, you're right I'm letting the people go and and we're gonna well, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn them loose I'm gonna let them go then the plagues would have stopped it would have stopped right then. I know it would have, God would have stopped because that's God. God is merciful. He is long-suffering. He is loving. He is kind. He's all those things. He's, he's got a hold of Pharaoh. He's like, look, man, I'm telling you, if you don't let my people go, I'm fixing to lay my hand upon you. But if you'll let them go, then I won't lay my hand on you. So he, he gives them an appointed time. He says, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. So what happens? Pharaoh continues in his, his uh, stubborn self and his, his hardened heart. So the Lord did this thing on the next day, just like he said, tomorrow. And all the livestock of Egypt died. But the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. So, so here you have, you know, God has absolutely done this incredible miracle. It's like he, he just, he did a dividing line. All the, all the children of Israel's livestock, they're fine. The, the livestock of the Egyptians died. So, I think Pharaoh, he's like, hmm, let me check this out. Verse 7, then Pharaoh sent 
And indeed, not even one of the livestock of the Israelites was dead. But the heart of Pharaoh became hard, and he did not let the people go. So Pharaoh sent out some folks to go check. Go check and see. Go see what the livestock are doing in the land of Goshen. The livestock in the land of Goshen were fine. The livestock in the land of Goshen were alive. They were good. But the livestock of, of the Egyptians were dead. Now you would think, okay, wow, look, man, God was able to make a difference between our livestock and their livestock and all those things. And, 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 and you would have thought that, that he would have said, man, that, you know, I, I, really need to, I really need to listen. This is, this is a God that, that, that is, has power over life and death. This is a God that's able to, to send, send miracles in a, in a mighty way, a powerful way, an awesome way. He's able to tell me when it's going to happen. He's able to discern between one side or the other. He's able to do all these. This is God. This is, a, this is an incredible God. But the heart of Pharaoh becomes hard, and he did not let the people go. Wow. You know, something I notice about, about this plague here is that God is finally sending death in the plague. Up to this point, there was no death. I mean, you know, it was discomfort. I mean, the water of the Nile was turned to blood. Well, that was, that was you know, that was nasty, and, and they couldn't drink it, and it stunk, and all those. And, and then the frogs, and, and, you know, all these things, they were all uncomfortable. But now, finally, in the fifth plague, you're seeing where God is sending death. Animals are dying. Livestock are dying. Things are happening. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's taking place. So the severity is starting to, to get higher and higher and higher. Um, you know, as God deals with us, it, at first God will nudge us. And, and, then, and then God will, will maybe push us a little harder and harder and harder. But eventually, if you continue um, in disobedience to God, why eventually He's going to send something hard enough that you're going to have to think about it. Okay, Pharaoh is thinking about it now, and I know he's thinking about it because he sent to check to see if the livestock of the Israelites were dead or not. He's checking now because he says, you know, because Moses told him the Lord's going to make a difference between your livestock and our livestock. Nothing's going to die of our livestock. Your livestock's going to die, but ours isn't. So Pharaoh said, Mom, let me check up on this and see what happens. He sends some people. They check on it. That's a fact. You would think that would, that would change his mind a little bit. The heart of Pharaoh became hard. Didn't let the people go. Sixth plague, verse 8. So the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Take for yourself handfuls of ashes from a furnace and let Moses scatter it toward the heavens in the sight of Pharaoh. So they take these ashes and they get out in front of Pharaoh so he can see it. And they throw the ashes up in the air. And it will become fine dust in all the land of Egypt. And it will cause boils that break out in sores on man and beast throughout all the land of Egypt. I want you to think about that first. I don't know if anybody's ever had a boil, but it's not pleasant. Now imagine if you're covered in boils and sores from something. I mean, you know, this is the kind of, kind of plague that, that God's now sending boils and, 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 and sores and all this stuff in the land of Egypt that's going to break out on man and beast throughout the land of Egypt. So verse 10, so they took the ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh. They stood before him to make sure that he can see this. See, this is, this is a lesson. I mean, God is trying to, to change Pharaoh's heart. Everybody says, well, God wasn't fair with Pharaoh. God was so fair, so long-suffering with Pharaoh. He's like, look, I want to show you. Watch, Pharaoh. Look, this is what God says to do. God says, scatter these ashes in the air. And now the next plague is going to be boils that break out and sores on man and beast. So they take the ashes from the furnace they stand before Pharaoh and Moses scatters them towards heaven and they cause boils that break out in sores on man and beast I mean you know exactly what God says is going to happen it, he, they do it and notice notice that that Moses is doing exactly what God tells him to do no more no less. He's just doing exactly what he's being completely obedient. See, obedience is a, is a powerful thing in the Word of God. The Word of God talks about obedience all the time. It's so important that we as Christians are obedient to the Lord. That's one of the ways we show our love for Jesus Christ is by obeying Him. That through obedience we show that we love Him. If you love someone, you will obey them. And, and so Moses is being very obedient. He's being very, 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 very obedient through all of this. So verse 11 tells us this. It says, And the magicians 
So you remember the magicians, so they started out doing pretty well. Um, water turned to blood, they could handle that. Bringing forth frogs, they could handle that. They couldn't get rid of frogs, but they, and they, they couldn't change the water back to, from blood, but they could make it, you know, they could do some of that stuff. But then by the third plague, why they could not uh, make lice from the dust. They couldn't do that. So, so they were kind of on the sidelines now. But notice how bad it is now. This is how powerful God is. The magicians could not stand before Moses. Why couldn't they stand before Moses? Well, they couldn't stand before Moses, first of all, because of the power of God. Okay. But it says because of the boils. So not only did, did everyone else get the boils, but the magicians also got the boils. The boils were on the magicians on, and on all the Egyptians. I mean, so, so his magicians, the ones that were able to, to counterfeit some of the, the things that God did, they can't even stand before Moses because they are wrapped up in boils and sores. They, 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 they can't. I mean, that's showing you the power of God. God is greater than all of this stuff. God is greater than the black arts. God is greater than magic. God is greater than the devil. God is greater than its demonic stuff. God is greater than all of that. God is greater. These magicians can't even stand before, before Moses. But notice what God tells Moses. Moses says that he's supposed to stand before Pharaoh and cast the stuff up in the air. Hallelujah. So you got Moses, the man of God, is able to stand before Pharaoh, but Pharaoh's magicians can't even stand before them. They can't even stand. But Moses is standing. Moses is doing all those things. The magicians couldn't stand before Moses, but Moses could stand before Pharaoh. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Notice that. So verse 12. But the Lord hardens the heart of Pharaoh. He did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. I want to, I want to talk about this, because a lot of people have a lot of problem with that. They say, well, it says right there that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. How can that be fair to Pharaoh if God hardened his heart? But other places it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. I mean, over and over again, you got this going on. But, but I, want to, I want to maybe ask you this question. Which decision seals our faith as a believer or an unbeliever? Which decision? Which time... When, when we were in a service and we felt the Holy Spirit of God moving and we could feel the presence. And I'm here to tell you that I don't care who you are. You may not understand the Holy Spirit. You may not understand that. Look, when I first uh, became a Christian, I did not understand the power of the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand healing. I didn't understand a lot of things. But what I did understand was that I could feel the presence of God. I feel the Holy Spirit right now. I feel Him right now just like He's, he's right here. He's in me. He's around me as we, as we come together. I feel Him. Which decision seals our fate as a believer or an unbeliever? Which time do we, do we blow off God and we say, no, nah, Oh, that man, I, that ain't nothing to that. Which time, which time is it that seals our fate as a believer or unbeliever? I mean, you know, it, it's kind of like that question: which drink caused someone to be an alcoholic? Was it the first drink? Was it the second drink? Was it the third drink? Was it the thousandth drink? Which one was it? I mean, I mean, you know, when we when we don't eat right or we do that, you know, um, which fat filled meal caused the blockage or the heart attack in me? Was it was it the first one I ate or the second one or the thousandth one or or ten years of them or which one put me over the edge? You know, which time did we deny the Lord was the one where we finally sealed or seared our conscience. You know, the Bible talks about having a conscience seared by sin. When something is seared, it no longer feels. It, it, you can get to a point where you sear your conscience so bad that God can't get through to you anymore. Which, which one, what happened that it finally seared your conscience and you no longer hear from the Spirit of God? Some people say, well, you can't get there, but I think you can because I think that Pharaoh is there. I think Pharaoh's been there. I think two or three decisions ago, Pharaoh had already seared his heart, seared his conscience in such a way that he's not listening to anything that God is saying. He's not taking any of this. He's just not going to, he's not going there. And so we, we've got to ask ourselves, how many times can you deny the power of God before you finally harden your heart in such a way that, that you can't feel the presence and the power of God anymore? So let's go on. Another plague. Hail. Wow. 
anybody watched hail before? You ever see hail? Hail's pretty interesting because it can be on a summer day. It could be 80, 85 degrees outside and, and hail falling like, you know, golf balls out of the sky. I remember when one of the tornadoes came through one time. Um, my boys and I, why, of course, Gina's trying to call us to tell us the tornado's coming and go take cover. And Dennis and Jackson and, and myself and possibly Alec was there. I can't remember. But we were all out on the porch watching the hail. Because we were like, man, this is cool. I mean, look at this. And it cooled down about 20 degrees. I mean, and hail was all over the ground. And as we looked over there, we could see the tornado coming through. And we could see the stuff just churning through the sky. And we're outside. We're watching. Because, you know, that's what we do in North Carolina. We don't, we, we watch, you know, we're not very intelligent, I think. But so I'm, we're watching the storm come through. You're like, wow, check this out, man. Is this cool or what? And Gina's freaking out. They won't answer the phone. That's because we were on the porch watching the storm, you know what I mean? So we got hail. Hail. Chapter 9, verse 13. It says, Then the Lord says to Moses, Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. See, now you're starting over again. Another phase, right? Another, another set of three. Rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. This is the seventh plague now. And say to him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. I mean, he should have figured out what the answer needed to be. I mean, every time, right? Now we're on number seven. Let my people go that they may serve me. For at this time, I will send all my plagues to your very heart. And to your servants and on your people, that they may know that there is none like me in all the earth. I mean, God is getting serious now. He's like, look, I've been, I, I might have, might have not been as serious before. You know, I've been giving you a chance. I've been long suffering. I've been kind. I've been, I've been, I've been striving with you. I've been trying to strive with you. But now He says, look, I'm here to tell you that you need to understand something. You need to let my people go that they might serve me. Because if you don't, I'm sending all my plagues to your very heart. I'm getting your servants. I'm getting your people. I'm going to make sure that you know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Because, see, we look at this as the, as the Israelites versus the Egyptians. But, see, I want you to see something here. That God was trying to show the whole world, Egyptian and Israelite, that He was God. He was trying to get them all in. He was trying to use these. These plagues were, were, were kind of like a way for God to... to uh, Pull the people in to show them who he was, to show them that their gods were not gods at all. That he was God, that he was the only God, that he was the great I am, that he was above all the other gods that they supposedly worshipped. That was him. There's no other God like me in all the earth. He's trying to show them as hard as he can. Verse 15. Now if I had stretched out my hand... And struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. God's like, look, y'all don't seem to understand my power. All I had to do was reach out and strike you, and I could have wiped you off the face of the earth. I could have wiped you out. We're in the seventh plague now. We've done this seven times now. I could have, I could have, I could have wiped you out the last six. I could have just wiped you off the face of the earth. Matter of fact, we didn't have to go through the blood and the frogs and all the things and the hail and all that. I could have just come up and, and wiped you out. But I didn't. And see, and that's what the thing about God. I'm here to tell you that there's times in my life where God probably should have just went and, and knocked me out. I've been done. But he didn't because he's long-suffering. He's kind. Even through the midst of these plagues, you see the long-suffering nature of God. God. All God wants is the Egyptians to worship him as God. That's all he wants. Just like the same thing he wants from us. He wants our worship. He wants our praise. He wants our hearts. He wants us to, to desire him. He wants us to, to praise his name. He wants to do all those things. That, that's all he wants from us. If I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from all the earth. Verse 16, but indeed, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. So he's telling us exactly why the plagues are taking place. He's telling them exactly why all this is going on for two reasons. The first purpose that he raised up Pharaoh for all this is that he might show his power in him. 
He's trying to show the people of Egypt. They worship Pharaoh as a god. And God is trying to use Pharaoh as a way to show the people who God really is and who is God and how powerful he is. And that my name may be declared in all the earth. He wants his name to go everywhere in the earth. He wants the, his name, the name of Yahweh, the great I am. That's the name that needs to be declared in all the earth. Verse 17, as yet you exalt yourself against my people and that you will not let them go. So Pharaoh, you're exalting yourself against my people. You're not going to let them go. Here he goes again. Behold, tomorrow about this time. Once again, he's going to tell them, when's the plague coming? Tomorrow about this time. So whatever time of the day it was, he says, tomorrow about this time. He says, rise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. So I'm saying tomorrow morning. Okay, tomorrow morning, about this time, I'm going to cause a very heavy hail to rain down. And not just any hail, not just a normal hail, but such as has not been in Egypt since its founding. Until now, I'm talking about the hail storm of all hail storms. This is going to be the worst that there ever was. Now, notice what God does. Once again, God shows his long-suffering, his, his love for the people, his, his, his desire. that His desire, remember, his purpose is only this, that he show his power through Pharaoh and that his name be declared in all the earth. That, that's why he's doing this. So 19, he says, Therefore, send now and gather your livestock and all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come down on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. God has given them a warning. God's warning them. He's telling them, look, I'm here to tell you, 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 you need to understand, that I, I, tomorrow morning this, there's going to be a, a great hailstorm that's coming, bigger than anything you've ever seen, ever, since the founding of this country, that you will never see anything like this. I'm going to send this, so you need to get up and you need to gather your livestock, all you have from the field, get them on in, every man, every animal, because if you leave them in the field and you don't bring them in, they will die. God warns them. What a warning. What a warning he gives right there. And you know, sometimes I think about how God warns us in times like this. I feel like God's warning us right now in the world we're living in right now. He's warning us. He's warning us. He's, he's telling us, look, y'all, I'm, I'm sending a warning. I'm sending a warning. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Are you understanding who I am? I am God. I am the great I am. I sent Jesus Christ into this world that you might have life through him. I did not send Jesus to condemn the world, but through him that you might have life and life eternal i have done this for you i've done this for you just oh hallelujah allow jesus christ to be your lord and savior seek me hunger after me thirst and desire for me if you will seek god you will find god if you seek him if you seek him well notice verse 20 here because i think this is this gives me hope in the midst of all this because all I've seen so far through all these plagues is a Pharaoh that says, no, 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 no. Don't believe you. Don't believe your power. Don't believe anything. I'm not. No, no, no. No, not letting the people go. Not going to do it. My heart's hard. That's it. I'm not doing it. But notice in verse 20, he who feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh. So see, some of these people now are seeing it. See, this was not for nothing. All these plagues were not for nothing. That in the midst of all of this, there were people that are seeing what's going on. They're fearing the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh and his servants and his livestock. And, and so the, what they did was they made the servants and their livestock go to their houses. So there were people there that are starting to be believers. There's people there that are starting to believe in the power of God. They're believing who he says he is. They're believing that he is the great I am. They're believing all those things. So they're putting their livestock up. They're fleeing to their houses. They're hiding away. But verse 21, But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. You know, God gives us warning. He gives us warning in this life. I mean, over and over and over again. When's, when's the Lord coming for his church? You know, when's the end? When's the end? And you know, and some people say, well, well, it's not the end of the world yet, but, but how long are you going to live? When are you going to take your last breath? 
When, when, when is it good? Because because that may very well come before the end. Amen. That may very well come before the rapture. We've been talking about the rapture. I mean, you know, for 2,000 years, we're waiting for God to come back and get his church. And I'm not saying he's not coming. He is coming. How, his, his word tells us that he will come. He will rapture the church. The dead in Christ will rise first. And we which remain will be gathered up together with them in the air to remain with the Lord forever. That's the word of God. That's the word of God. That's what it says. I mean, you know, because we, we, can, we can speculate, all that. That's what God's word says. But the thing is, is that when is that time? You know, he's giving us a time right now. He's giving us a time that we can concentrate, we can focus on him, that we can give our lives to him, that we can understand and realize that there is a God out there. Hallelujah, that's bigger than all of this. He's bigger than all of this. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. So verse 22 tells us this. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt. On man, on beast, and on every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. So all Moses had to do was stretch his hand out. So Moses stretches out his rod toward heaven and the Lord sent thunder and hail and fire darted to the ground and the Lord rained hail on the land of Egypt. So there was hail and fire mingled with the hail. Man, this was some kind of storm. I'm here to tell you a lightning storm of, of cosmic proportions. Fire and hail and all these things going on. So very heavy that there was none like it in all all the land of Egypt since it became a nation and the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt I mean it's beating everything to pieces and all that was in the field both man and beast and the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field I mean this is some hail now it's breaking the trees down notice this only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were there was no hail no hail Praise the Lord for that. Oh my goodness, hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that God can place a hedge of protection around His children, right? God can do that. But see, I want you to notice something about this. His children in the land of Goshen, now I am sure, and I would almost guarantee this, that they probably took cover when the storm came, right? Because He said, look, if you, if you want to make it through this, then you need to get your animals out of the field. You need to get out of the field. Get in your house. I bet they were standing watching from their homes. And then they're like, well, why ain't it hailing here? Why is there no lightning here? Why is this going on? But they were heeding the warning of God each and every time. They were heeding the warning of God. And, and so, so we got to understand that, that, that we've got to heed the warning of God. And God can place a hedge of protection around the people of God. But we can't be disobedient. As soon as you step into disobedience, then all bets are off. As soon as you're being disobedient to God, then you're on your own. You're no longer walking in the perfect will of God. You're no longer in the, in the smack dab in the middle of, of God's will for your life. So if you, if you disobey God, then you're on your own. So only in the land of Goshen where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. Now notice what Pharaoh does. 27, Pharaoh sent. He calls for Moses and Aaron. He says to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous. And my people and I are wicked. I mean, I, I want you to see that, that he's, he's, he's confessing in a way there. He's like, you know, man, I, 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 I'm confessing. I'm confessing. I have sinned. I am wicked. I confess. I confess. God, you're right. You are righteous. You are holy. I am wicked. I am sinful. I, I have sinned. But notice what's missing from that. Because I've seen, I've seen people that will tell you, yes, I'm a sinner. Yes, I know I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not living a life that I should. I know that I should give my life to the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that, that the wages of sin are death. I know all those things. I understand all those things. And yes, I am a sinner. And yes, I am all them things. But notice what's missing here. What's missing here is this. He said, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my God and I are wicked. It doesn't say anything about repentance. See, we can all admit that we're messed up. We can all admit, look, my life is a soup sandwich right now. I, I'm not following the God. I'm not doing as I should. And I hear people all the time, well, you know, preacher, I, I really should live better. I should do this and I should do that. And then I ask, well, why don't you? Well, that's because they'll confess that they're a sinner, but they will not repent. 
Repentance means turn away from your sin, change your life, change the way you're living, change what you're doing, change, change, change. That's where faith without works is dead. See, we got faith. We know who God is, but faith without works, without repentance, without doing those, that's dead. It, you can say all you want. Talk is cheap. It's how we live our lives after we've confessed our sin that's important. He said, I've sinned this time. The Lord's righteous. My people and I are wicked. So verse 28. So what's he say? Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it's enough. And I'll let you go, and you shall stay no longer. I mean, he's like, look, just tell God to make it stop. You, you've got the power. I know you do. I watched you throw the ashes in the air, and we, were, we had boils. I, I've seen you hold the staff up, and a, and a thunder and lightning storm come like nothing we've ever seen. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. I saw you turn the, the water to blood. I've seen all of those things. I've seen it. Would you just tell God to stop? No more mighty thundering. No more hail. It's enough. I'll let you go. I'll let you go. And you shall stay no longer. I feel like Moses knew Pharaoh's heart. In verse 29, so Moses says to him, As soon as I've gone out of the city, so as soon as I've walked out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease. There'll be no more hail that you may know that the earth is is the Lord's. I mean, I want you to understand, you know, Moses is, he is, he is witnessing, he's testifying to the power of God, and that's the way we need to live our lives. We need to live our lives in such a way that it's a testimony to the power of God. It's a testimony that every time we, we spread our hands out to heaven, every time we pray, every time we worship, every time we, we live our lives, that it be a testimony to God, that they would see and understand and know that the earth and is the Lord's. All of this is God's. We are just occupying some space here there's going to come a day when he's going to call us home we'll leave everything behind and we will go to be with the Lord because the earth is the Lord's it's his but verse 30 but as for you and your servants I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God I believe that that God gave him a word of wisdom or word of knowledge there, that he knew. I mean, the Lord was saying, look, look, let him know. I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. I know that you, you don't yet fear him. You don't yet fear him. We've been through this seven times. It's the seventh time. We've been through it seven times. I, I'm going to spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder is going to cease. There's going to be no more hail that you might know the Lord, earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know you will not yet fear the Lord. Verse 31, now the flax and the barley were struck, for the barley was in head and the flax was in bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck for their late crops, so they weren't, they weren't uh, headed out yet. They, they, they had, not, had not got to maturity. So verse 33, so Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord. I just love that, that Moses was so obedient to God. I mean, I, I just love that Moses was so willing to intercede for Pharaoh. I think Moses by now has got the understanding. He's starting to realize that this is bigger than just, just Pharaoh and him. That this is about God showing who he is. That this is about God, God's um, uh, righteousness and, and God's power and God's, God's witness and testimony to the world. That, that not only did God want the Hebrew children to worship him, but he wanted the children of Egypt also to worship him. Through the midst of this, he's trying to, to woo Pharaoh. He's trying to woo Pharaoh's servants. He's trying to woo the Egyptian people. He's trying to show the whole world who he is through the midst of this. So Moses goes out from the city from Pharaoh. He spreads out his hands to the Lord. And then the thunder and the hail ceased. And the rain was not poured on the earth. Isn't that beautiful? Moses just went out there, obeyed God, and it just stopped. Man, what a man of God. An awesome man of God. That's that's obedience. Obedience. When God, when you do what God tells you to do, then you see the results of God in your life. Okay. If you do what God tells you to do, no more, no less. Just do what God tells you to do. Go out, stretch out your hands, and cry out to the Lord, and then you're going to see things change. The thunder, the hail ceased. The rain was not poured on the earth. Now notice what happens. Verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain 
the hail and the thunder ceased. He sinned yet more. See, once again, what you had was you had a false confession. I mean, a lot of folks say, well, well, how could somebody, you know, say the words? How could somebody pray a sinner's prayer? How could somebody do that? Well, people do it all the time. People do it all the time. They come, they, they get under conviction. They get, they get you know, the, the, the Spirit's moving in the church, and they, and they run up to the, to the altar rail, and, and they say, Pastor, I, I want to get saved. I, I need to be saved. I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. And they pray that prayer, and they say, Lord Jesus, please save me, a sinner. And they do all those things, and as soon as they walk out of the church, as soon as they walk out the door, as soon as they have the first chance to deny Christ, as soon as they have the first chance when they deny Him, then they sin yet more. No repentance. Just lip service to God. Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, the thunder had ceased, and he sinned yet more. Well, Lord removed all the consequences, all those things. Now I'm going to... And he hardened his heart. Pharaoh's hardening his heart to God. And see, that's the thing. People do this all the time. There's so many times when God has been so gracious in our lives. I mean, to where we didn't know what we were going to do. I can tell you there was a time when my youngest son, he, he needed, needed um, growth hormones. And, and they told me, they said, well, your insurance won't even cover that. And I'm like, well, well how much are they a month? And they said $9,000 a month. And I said, $9,000 a month? I don't, we don't make $9,000 of There's no way. I, I can't do that, God. I cannot do that. So then we, we, we wrote to the, the drug company that made it. And we said, look, we, we can't do this. And then they were like, oh, oh, happy day. Look, we are going to cover the growth hormones. And I was like, praise the Lord, they're going to cover the growth, growth hormones. Yes, hallelujah. I was so excited. I was like, yes, you've answered our prayer, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're covering the growth hormones. And they said, yeah, and all you have to do is, is pay, pay the, uh, the, the deductible. And I said, okay, well, what's the deductible? I said, well, it's only 10%. And I was like, oh, man, I can do math. I don't even have to take my shoe off to do that one. I, I knew that 10% of 9000 is $900, $900 a month, and that was still more than what I could I was well, like, well, you know, I guess we'd give up eating or something. You know, we give up one of those non-essential things like food and lights and all those things, and we're going to do that. And, and, and so, so we, we decided, you know, Lord, we, we can't do that. And, we, and so we continue to pray, and we continue to pray, and we continue to seek God. And you know what? Eventually, we got a letter, and guess what they said? They said, guess what? We're going to give you the growth hormones free. Well, that was God, okay? Y'all, that was God. That was, not, that was not anything but God. That was God. He, he, he came through. He's come through in my life time and time and time again. He comes through, and I give him the praise for it every time. It wasn't anything I did. It wasn't how I lived. It wasn't anything. It was God being merciful on one of his children that he knew that I needed those growth hormones for my child, and so he was going to release that into my life. However he could do it, he was going to do it, and he used doctors and, and nurses and, and drug companies and all kinds of things. He ordered all of my steps to where that happened. And, and what I need to do when something like that happens in my life is I need to praise him. I need to say, thank you, Jesus. Any time that you have a bill that you're like, there's no way in the world I can pay this bill, take it to God. Take it to God. He's got the cattle of a thousand hill. Take the bill to God. Say, Lord, I am your child. I'm standing on the word of God, believing that you're able to, to do these things. And, and so, God, I just pray, Lord, that you, you handle it. And when he comes through, though, and he will, he will come through for you. Church, I'm telling you, I've seen it time and time again. I've seen people that had stuff that they said, there's no way you're ever going to be healed. And in the name of Jesus, we prayed over them. We anointed them with oil, and they were healed in Jesus' name. I know it. And we gave them all the praise and all the glory for it. And we saw beautiful things that happened. But when it happens, and it's going to happen, when it happens, you got to give them the praise. you got to give them the glory. you got to give them the honor. Oh, all Pharaoh had to do when he saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, it's Instead of sinning against God, all he had to do was thank you, Yahweh. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. I know who you are. I know you're mighty. You're more powerful than all the gods of Egypt. You're more powerful than any God. You are the only God. All he had to do was do that, and then God would have stopped the whole thing. We would have a story with only seven plagues. Praise God. Everybody would say, seven is completion. It's a perfect outcome. Hallelujah. All he had to do, that's all Pharaoh had to do, give in to God. But 
when he knew that he was out of the bind. And I think that's what we do sometimes. We get out of the bind. And we forget who took us through. Who got us out. So he hardened his heart. He and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go. As the Lord had spoken by Moses. I'm, I mean, whew, man, I'm, I'm here to tell you, y'all. I, some people, I don't know what it takes. I don't know what it takes to get people to praise God. I don't know what it takes to get people to, to give God his glory in your life. I, I'm here to tell you that there's, that, you know, and, and here's the thing about it, y'all, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this tonight. I, I want to I close with this word to you tonight. I know a lot of times we get, we get in a bind. We get in a situation. We, we, we get to where we don't know what we're going to do, and so then what we do is we try to make deals with God. Right? Like, Lord, if you, if you uh, get me out of this bind, I'll go to church every day. Every, every, every time, if the door's open, I'm coming through the doors. You know, Lord, if you, if you, if you get me out of this bind, Lord, I'm going to sing in the choir. I'm, I'm going to sing in the choir. Lord, if you get me out of this, I'm going to teach a Sunday school class. I'm going to lead a small group. Lord, if you get me out of this, every chance I get, I'm going to stand up in church and I'm going to testify to your goodness. And I've heard all these people make all these deals with God. And you know what usually happens when people make deals with God? Because first of all, you can't make deals with God. He, he holds all the cards. There's no dealing with God. You, de- God is God. Hallelujah. He, he, he does what He does. And, and we, we, what we are supposed to do is we are supposed to obey Him. We're supposed to honor Him. We're supposed to love Him. We're supposed to praise His name. We're supposed to worship Him. We're supposed to do all those things. But I've seen people over and over again that they're making deals with God. And then when it comes down to it, they're very faithful at first. And then all of a sudden you're like, Sister Wendy, we're so... Ins- man, they... God moved mightily and powerfully in their life. And where are they at now? What happened to them? I don't see them at church anymore. They're not at our church. Are they at somebody else's church? Because we don't, we don't see them anywhere. And then they're gone. And then they just walk right away from God. And it's like, oh, once, once the hardship gets out of the way, once God gets the bill paid, once God heals your body, once he takes that cancer, once he fixes your family, once he saves your marriage, once he saves your children, your wayward kids, once all those things take place, then all of a sudden, where are they at? You can't find them. So there's lessons in all this for all of us. So I want to go ahead and close with, with a word of prayer tonight. Pat, if you'll give me a little bit of, little bit of background here. We, um, but I, but I, want to, I want to close with, with prayer tonight. Because I hear so many people right now in the midst of this pandemic. And, and I'm with you on this one, y'all. I want us to have a full church again. I want us to be able to, to come together again. I want to be able to hug Pat or hug Wendy or hug my brother back there, Brother Tom. You know, I want to, I want to shake hands with y'all. I, I want to love on y'all because I like to touch folks yeah. because, because I, you know, when I pray with you, I want to lay hands on you, okay? Because I believe that there's a transfer, that there's, there's a power that, that takes place as we touch one another. And, and, you know, so, so I'm looking for that day when we can gather as the church again and we're not worried about all this pandemic and this COVID-19 and all this stuff. And I'm, I'm looking for that day, y'all. And, and, I, and I'm like, Lord, when is that going to take place? I know that there's going to come a day. We're going to get back to that. I, I know that. And, and, and so what, what, I, what I encourage us maybe as a church to do is to remember how badly you're yearning to be here right now. As I speak to you on, on, on Facebook right now, my church members, my folks, Stony Runners, those of you out there, I, I'm, I'm speaking to you right now. You're as bad as you want to be here, and I've talked to a lot of you, and you've said, man, I just, I just wish it, things would get back to normal. I just wish we could get back to church. I just wish we could do that. And, and I encourage you, and, I, and I, I pray that you're praying with me that, yes, this will pass, because it will. God's going to take it. God's going to get it. Hallelujah. He's going he's gonna to move this thing out of the way. Yes. It, this is not permanent. This is a temporary temporary bump in the road. God just wanted to slow us down. God That's wanted right. us to focus us on Him, completely and totally on Him, and let us understand and realize that if God wants to shut the whole world down, He can shut it down. That's right. I mean, this thing went so fast, it's, it, it's so fast it made my head spin. I mean, next thing, one Sunday we're in here, we're having church, next Sunday we ain't, we ain't having church. That's I mean, right. I'm like, what in the world's going on? God, move that fast. God can move that fast. But I'm here to tell you tonight, church, I, I pray that when we get to the other side of this, 
Hallelujah. That you remember all those days when you said, Lord, if you'll just let us back in the church. Yes. If you'll just let us back in the church. God, if you will just let us gather again. If you'll just let me to hug my brothers and sisters' neck. If you'll just let me to get in there underneath the preaching of the church. That if I could just get to Sunday school again. If I could just do all those things. Lord, I am going to praise you. Hallelujah. That the glass in the window is going to break from the yep. praise in the house of God. But I want you to remember... What you saying right now? Right. I want you to remember yes. that because there's going to come a time, hallelujah, when God's going to turn us loose again as the church Amen. and he's going to let us Amen. get back together again. And when we get yes. in here, I want to see all the seats full. I want to see everybody out here that said, oh, if I could just get back to church, if there was yes. some way I could get in the house of God, I want the house full and I want people praising him with everything they've yes. got, thanking him. Lord, I thank you that I'm able to come to church. I am thank you that I'm able to sit in the same building with my pastor. I'm thankful that I'm able to come in here and sit in this choir off and be able to sing yes. the praises of God. I'm so thankful and I'm here to tell you church he wants to do it and yes, he's just he waiting he's waiting. Oh he's got timing hallelujah. Just like the plagues he said there'll be a plague tomorrow at this time. There'll be this at that time. There'll be that at that time. There's going to be a time when the church are going to be open again. Yes. Hallelujah. When we're going to be able to gather again and you just remember 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 what you were telling God you were going to do in the midst of the plague, in the midst of the epidemic, you remember what you promised God and bring that promise back to the throne of grace. So let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father God, we just thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. God, I thank you that this is not permanent. This is temporary. God, there's going to come a time where we're going to be able to gather as the church again. That Stony Run is going to be back together as the family of God that we've always been, Lord. That we're going to be touching one another. That we're going to be hugging one another. We're going to be shaking hands, God. We're going to be high-fiving each other, thanking you, Jesus. And God, I pray, Lord, that when we get back together that we will not take this for granted any longer. That we'll realize what a blessing it is to be able to come together and yes. sit in the church together and be able to worship together Amen. and see our brothers and sisters in Christ. And Lord, everything that we're promising you right now, that, it, that I promise you, Lord, when this is over, I'm going to do this. And I promise you, Lord, when this is over, I'm going to do that. God, I pray, Lord, that we would honor every single one of our promises to you. And Lord, I believe that as we promise to you and we worship you and we serve you, God, Lord, that your heart there's going to come a time where you're going to say, this is enough, it's enough, it's enough. The pandemic will pass. People will get well. Folks quit dying. And Lord, then we'll have all the opportunity in the world to praise you. And so God, I just thank you tonight. I thank you for your goodness. I thank Amen. you for grace, thank your you, mercy, Lord. your love, your long-suffering kindness, God. And Lord, I just pray, God, that you would just touch your church. Stir us up, Lord. Stir us up as the eagle stirs up the nest, Lord. Lord, I know that you're just trying to get us out of the nest that we might soar on those heavenly winds as you want us to, God. And Lord, I'm just thanking you for everything. I'm thanking you for everything. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. I love you. See you Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Amen. Tune in. Hallelujah.